Today I'm going to be doing a graphite drawing demonstration of my shoulder chicken. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. For this project, the majority of the pencils that I used were the Faber-Castell 9000 and the new Derwent Graphics. And I do want to stress, make sure if you're going to get the Derwent Graphics, get the new ones. They are so much smoother than the old ones. This is what the tin you want should look like. That makes a big difference right now, so make sure that's the one you get. I also used a lot of graphite powder, which I'm really excited to show you for this background. And it got really smooth, very, very dark, very quickly. If you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure you head over where the one hour version of this tutorial is available for you now. Now we'll move on to this tutorial. I'm using a soft tool sponge. Those are the ones that are typically used for pan pastels. I'm using that to apply my graphite powder. And of every tool I've ever tried for applying graphite powder, this by far gave me the best results. I was so happy with the coverage that I got here because when I've tried using paint brushes, soft brushes, or just any tool that I've tried in the past for applying it, it, I didn't get such nice even coverage. I always had a little bit of a grainy gritty look. With this, I got a very, very soft coverage. And with those sponges, you can get the angled ones like I'm using here and this lets me actually outline my subject so it's not super messy. I'm just going to go ahead and fill this in and I don't have to worry about this being super smooth because I'm going to come back through and erase little circles for that background. I just want to get it so that I don't have a grainy gritty feel. And this is so much faster. I, from here on out, will most likely use this technique for getting dark backgrounds. Even if I was doing a sort of out of focus, maybe a forest in the background, I think I would still apply it this way because it is so much faster and I really, really like the results that I got. You can continuously rework these areas and you don't really end up polishing it like you would with graphite pencil. If you used a pencil and kept reworking and reworking an area, you're going to start polishing it and end up with that high shine. That was not the case when applying the powder like this. And it's a little bit messy, but not quite like charcoal. The feel of charcoal, you guys know, I don't use charcoal or pastels because I don't like how they feel on my hands. While this was messy, it didn't have that feel to it. Just going to fill all of this in. Then I'm going to take a pencil and add another layer on top of this. This was kind of cool because I was able to darken this up quite a bit by taking my pencils, lightly shading over everything, and then going on top of it with more graphite powder to smooth everything out that much more. This one is the Mars Lumograph, the Stedler Mars Lumograph. This was the 8B or 7B. So this one has a little bit of graphite powder, or graphite, I say graphite powder, I can't talk. Um, carbon pencil mixed in with the graphite. So it's a little bit darker than your regular graphite pencil. You can see I'm being pretty messy here. I'm not using very clean techniques where normally I would say keep the pencil sharp and work in tiny circles, really get that graphite into the tooth of the paper. But I found that because I was going to go over it with the graphite powder with the soft tool brush or sponge, this was going to blend out completely, completely smooth. I'm just adding another layer of graphite. I'm not pushing very hard. I don't want to damage the tooth of the paper and I don't want to polish it. So now I'm coming on top of that with a graphite powder and look how smooth this comes out. It blended so well and I do have graphite powder applied directly to this soft tool. Just softening out all of those edges. And I can repeat this process as many times as I want. I found that I just wasn't getting that shiny look that I typically get when doing something where you keep reworking an area with a graphite pencil. So now I am taking an eraser and I'm coming through and pulling out circles. And this reference photo, I do have it available over on Patreon. If you would like to draw this one, it's available for everybody. You don't have to be a member to pick this one up. So you can head over there and check that out. Pulling out lots of circles here. I'm just moving that, that eraser in a circular motion. I don't have to have these circles completely circular. I mean, they have to be a circle shape, but they don't have to be perfect circles to achieve the look that I'm going for. And I do want to make sure that I overlap these. That's a big deal. Don't just put dots everywhere or you end up with polka dots, unless you're going for that type of a background. Here, for the type that I'm going for, I've got to make sure that these overlap. I'm also going to come back through and do a little bit of shading over some of these because I don't want them all to be the same value. I want some a little bit lighter and some a little bit darker. So to start with, I just erase everything about the same and then I can blend or shade over some of these. 
And after seeing what the graphite powder could do in combination with that soft tool, I'm really anxious to do another graphite piece where I have a much more detailed background using these tools. It's normally such a long, long process, but this sped things up very quickly. Lots and lots of circles, and you can see how I'm starting to overlap more and more of them. And you want to make sure you get different sizes, too. If they're all the exact same size, you're back to that polka dot look. Once those are in, I can come back through and do a little bit of shading using that soft tool with some graphite powder on it. Not too much. Clean up some of those circles. I'm going to go ahead and add another layer. I want to darken that up a bit more. And I'm adding it with the pencil. I'm using a very dark pencil. This one is was likely the 6 or 7B. And then I'm going over that with the graphite powder. Just smoothing everything out. And now I can start on my shoulder chicken. So I'm starting with his eye because this is the darkest point and I find that it is so much easier to judge your values when you're working, especially in black and white like this. It's so much easier to judge your values if you can block in a couple of the darkest areas. So the eye definitely going to be one of them. If I'm working on a cat or a dog, usually the inside of the ear will be very dark or the nose. I will normally block those in first just so that I can much more easily judge the values on the rest of the piece. It's really easy to think that you're going too dark when in fact you're not even close to being dark enough. So if I can block in the areas that I know are as dark as I can get them, that makes it much easier for me to get the rest of the values correct as I work. So lightly shaded in the with the graphite powder and a brush you saw me use um, just a minute ago, the crest, and then I came back through with my Tombow Mono Eraser to pull out highlights. Cleaning up the edges around the beak there. When you use those soft tool sponges and the graphite powder, even if you're very careful, you do tend to get a little bit messy, but it's no big deal because you just take an eraser and erase those edges. So this area we're going to go through very, very quickly because this was on the live stream. I will have a link in the video description if you want to check that out. But I'm going through and just paying attention to tiny, tiny little details. Really watching the direction of those feathers. Now here, once I move on to the beak, I've got to watch the ridges in the beak. Don't look at a bird and assume, okay, it's a black beak or it's a gray beak. We'll just make it solid one color. Unless what you're doing is it's a subject that's far in the distance where you wouldn't see the ridges. If you're up close like this, you're going to see that kind of detail. So make sure to watch for that when you are drawing beaks. They'll usually have ridges kind of like your fingernails can have. So make sure you capture those. It makes the beak look much more realistic. And really watch your values. If you don't have one, a value found, founder, a value finder can make it much, much easier. And I'll have a link to one of those in the video description and a video of how you can make your own. It makes it much easier to judge the values on your subject. Also, if you're working in graphite, make sure you switch your, your reference photo to black and white. That also will help you to have a much easier time of getting the values where you need it to go or need them to go. Grammar is not my strong point today. As I move these little pencil lines, I'm making sure that I'm following the direction of the feathers. I don't need every single line to be exact. I need the general where the dark areas and the lighter areas are to be exact, but besides that, each individual feather does not need to be perfect. No one's going to know the difference. Well, you guys will because I'm sharing the reference photo with you, but the average viewer is not going to notice the difference. I'm using another soft tool brush there to get some more blending on top of the dark area with some graphite powder. This is a mechanical pencil. Now, my mechanical pencil has A and 4B lead, which you can't find anymore. They do still make A and 3B lead, and I think that would be a, a fair alternative. With that one, though, make sure you get the high polymer. Don't get the stein. The stein, is it doesn't work well. It's a very hard lead. For this to get super dark, you want the high polymer A and 3B in this case, I think would work well. A little bit more work with my Tombow Mono Eraser, pulling out those fine, fine details. Again, just really watching the direction of each of these pencil strokes. 
I'll switch over to the mechanical pencil where I want something really a tiny tiny area to be very dark it's much easier to control and I don't have to continuously sharpen it like I do the graphite pencils by themselves now to be honest I could just use my my fabric castell 9000 the graphite the darker ones in there and get a similar effect but the mechanical pencil I don't have to sharpen the back of the head here I kept very very white it's lit a lot normally with white I don't leave super white but here I wanted the contrast with the background and on that reference photo I do have that area a bit washed out but I really liked that contrast between the bright bright white on the back of the neck and the dark background so I went ahead and left that whereas normally you guys know I shade most areas that are white at least a little bit now for the transition of the white feathers into the gray feathers around his, between his neck and his body, I do want to make sure the white feathers are in the right location and that the dark feathers are in the right location. But other than that, if a feather is slightly out of place, that's really not a big deal. Using the soft tool there with the graphite powder, just to darken in the darkest portion of his body, or that back wing, the back wing opposed to his front wing. I like to use words that are super helpful. Now using my mechanical pencil, this one again is that A and 4B lead, which I wish they still made. Maybe if enough of us contact the company and request it, they'll start producing it again. Just getting that area really dark. I don't want to rework the same area again and again or push really hard because that's going to polish the graphite to a high shine, which doesn't photograph very well. You can see I'm just getting my base shadows in there with that soft tool and then I'm coming back through with my pencil and doing the finer details, the little teeny tiny things. Really watching the direction of those feathers here. When you're drawing birds, don't try to force the shape of a feather where a shape of a feather should not be. In this case, you can see the feathers on the dark portion of his wing that I'm working on. That's very smooth. You don't see a lot of individual feathers there. Those feathers are very, very sleek. They're all pretty much the same color, and you don't have a lot of variation. Don't try to force detail where detail is not needed. Really watch your reference photo, and especially in this case, this is a very, very clear reference photo. You can really see where detail is needed and where detail is not. Don't force it where it doesn't belong. You can really easily end up with a bird that looks like he has fish scales. Especially a lot of smaller birds, their, their feathers are not so well defined individually as when one area like a chickadee, so much of them is one color like on their chest. You're not going to see a bunch of individual feathers there. You'll have sort of little lines kind of like how this guy has on the gray portion of his cheek, but that's normally about it. So really watch that reference photo. Don't force detail where it's not needed. I see that a lot, especially when people draw owls. They'll try to force in each feather on their chest in really odd shapes, and it makes it not look very realistic. It's great if you're going for a stylized, cartoony feel, but if you're going for realism, watch that reference photo. We get in our head that this is how a feather looks, and we try to force those feathers everywhere, and it doesn't look natural. I also want to watch the direction of the feathers here. Notice how the dark of the bottom section of his neck, where it meets the white, how it curves up. It rounds off there. If you, I flatten that out, and you go straight across, and this is something I'll see people do a lot, too, on a bird, like in this case, where you've got two different colors where the head and the neck meet. Don't go straight across. You flatten things out. Look how this curves up, and it gives you a more three-dimensional feel. You don't want to go, okay, the head's white, straight line, and then the body. It really, you flatten that out completely. And that's going to be the case anytime you're working on something that's very three-dimensional, like a, let's say you're painting a cup or a jar. Notice where it rounds off. Really watch that and make sure that you capture that in your artwork so that it doesn't look flat. And I'm using a combination of my pencils here with that Tombow Mono Eraser for some finer details. You do not want to push very hard. You don't want to polish that graphite pencil. And as I move this pencil, I'm moving it in small ovals where I'm filling in these sections. It looks like I'm just kind of scribbling because the video is sped up, but it's basically small ovals so that I get nice smooth coverage. And 
Another tip I have for you, if you're having a hard time getting grainy gritty looks over a dark area, one thing that may be happening, if you're jumping straight to your darkest pencil, like your 8B or 7B, and you're doing that straight on top of white pencil, it's really hard for those the softer lead to get into all of the little nooks and crannies of the paper. So this is where I like to take a lighter lead, like a 2H, fill that in first with a very light hand. I'm not pushing hard, but that way I don't have the contrast between white paper up against the darkest lead. I'm going now from a mid-tone, a grayish tone that I was able to create with the sharp lead or the hard lead, the, four, the 2H, and then put the dark on top of that. I'm able to get a much smoother end result and avoid a lot of that grainy gritty feel. Plus the softer leads, which are gonna be the darker leads, like your 7B, 6Bs, those ones tend to dull very quickly, and so it's harder for them to be to kept at such a sharp point that they really get into all the nooks and crannies of some of the different types of paper. So doing that lighter tone first, and again, don't push hard, because if you push too hard with a 2H and then try to come on top of it with a 4B or whatever, it's not going to stick as well because you've polished that area. Keep a very light hand so that you don't polish it. That way you're able to keep adding layers. But with graphite, there are a lot of layers, very much like when I work in colored pencil. I'll start with the lighter layers and then work up to the darker zones in most cases. starting to clean up some of these finer details. And I keep the tightest details up by his face. I loosen things up just a bit as I move away from his face. I'm gonna soften that out a little bit with what little graphite powder was left on that soft tool brush. I'm not having to continuously reload it because I don't want this to be super dark, but I did want to soften some of that out a bit. Pulling out some highlights with the Tombow Mono Eraser. Cleaning up a few more edges, just little teeny tiny details here and there. Again, really watching the direction of those feathers which direction those lines need to go in. I don't care if I have the exact same amount of feathers. I'm not sitting there counting, okay, there's 14 feathers going this way and six feathers going down. I'm not that precise. That to me is unimportant. What I wanna do is capture the general movement and feel of those feathers. Using the graphite, or I'm sorry, the mechanical pencil again to darken up a few areas here. And as usual, as I get towards the end of this piece, I stop relying so heavily on the reference photo. I put that away in many cases and just really back away from my piece and look at what mine needs. Do I need to go darker in an area? Would it look better if I brightened one area up so that it really stood out? So, I mean, at this point, I've got the markings. I know where the markings on this guy go. So that's all going to be accurate. But sometimes it's going to look better if you darken an area more than what your reference has photo has or lighten an area more than what your reference photo has. When doing pet portraits, you do want to make sure the markings are in the right place, but sometimes it is going to be better to, to adjust your values a bit to make it a stronger piece. And that's really what I do at this point. Watching little details, I just keep backing away from the piece and deciding, okay, a little bit more work here, a little bit more work there. But that is really where I stop depending so much on that reference photo and just decide what mine needs. And all of these tiny little details, they add up to making a big difference. It's really easy to look at your piece or even look at this piece when I was, still had another three hours to work on it and go, okay, good enough, it looks done. If you spend that extra time, just keep working on it a little bit longer. Sometimes you will notice things and adjust your values just enough to make your piece much, much stronger than it otherwise would have been bunch of little teeny areas in here and these tiny tiny little feathers between the eye and the beak most of those are really just little dots I'm not trying to shape an actual feather a little dot is enough to get the texture that I need for that area tiny tiny little dark areas and that is it for this guy. Again, if you want to pick up this reference photo to draw yourself I do have that posted for everybody over at patreon Normally I would have this sitting on the easel behind me, but I'm working on an oil painting portrait at the moment and it's wet and I don't want to move it and 
mess something up. So I'm just going to awkwardly hold this drawing here. My parents are visiting. Actually, by the time this video goes up, they'll have already gone home, but they'll be here for four days. And that means four days of me not working. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but I pretty much don't take days off. It's super rare if I take a whole day off. So I'm trying to get a whole bunch of stuff done ahead of time so that I can take days off while they're there. I know I'm still going to end up working, but I'm getting ahead on paintings, and that's why the wrong painting is currently behind me. This is a painting that I'm working on that will be up next week. Actually, the live stream for this will have gone up before. I'm so confused on days right now. It's kind of like really confusing time travel and making these videos. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round. has an orange arrow going to it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all five. That's ten. Five. I can't count. Of my art videos every single week. I'll see you guys tomorrow.